I think the consistency uh, and the routine brings confidence. I think yeah, nothing else does really. If you feel like you can repeat a same amount of work or if you can repeat a shot many times and be precise, that's what's going to give you the confidence that you're getting stronger, that you feel better. You have to build something uh, solid and that comes from consistency in, in doing uh, simple things. What gives us our edge? And how do we go beyond it? How thin is the line between taking part and tipping into victory? What inspires those moments of rare advantage that change the shape of a race? Are winners born or made? And what happens when things go wrong or when it all goes right? Welcome to The Edge. We'll be talking to people operating at the very edge of possibility. From athletes to actors, and from artists to entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Theo van den Bruecke. Watch out. This is The Edge, a podcast by Tag Heuer. Hi, Felix. How are you? Hi, Theo. Nice to meet you. I'm good. Thank you. Love, lovely to meet you. Thank you for taking the time today and thank you for joining us at The Edge. Fantastic to have you here. Um, so I guess for, this, for, for those listeners who don't necessarily know your story, you grew up in Quebec, you're 20 years old and you've been seen yeah. as the number 20 tennis player in the world, which is an extraordinary thing. And you've done all of that in a very, very short space of time. How has that journey been? <laughs> what, what, has, what And what has the journey been for you? Well, uh, you know, the journey has been... Uh... Nothing but amazing, really, um, and everything I always uh, hoped for. And you know, since I'm a kid, like you said, I I grew up um, in Quebec uh, City. I was uh, born in Montreal, but then raised in um, a quiet uh, little neighborhood in, in Quebec City. And you know, to go from there, dreaming of becoming a professional player, and every year improving, uh, going up in uh, the rankings. Um, achieving more and more uh, things on the on the tennis world the tennis circuit at a very young age it was uh, it, it was a great thing and I think I was always able to to stay on the right track and, and focus on the right things and that I guess what um, allowed me to uh, to perform the way I did in the recent years but uh, to be honest uh, at many moments it's been uh, more than I expected even though I always uh, had a a high belief in myself that I, I could uh, I could achieve these things. I imagine. I mean, if, as we say, you know, you're 20 years old. That you, you know, you, you're barely out of kind of being 18. It's an extraordinary thing. How do you kind of cope with that pressure? Because it is an enormous amount of pressure. You're kind of doing this on your own as a kind of individual. Is it? Do you have to kind of find ways to manage it? How How do you deal with it? Well, I'm I'm really lucky to have good people around me. I think you know it's the first thing. Mm. Um, and for anybody, it's good to have, you know, a good family around you, friends, good friends. And in terms of my prof professional team, uh, I've been very blessed to, to have uh, great coaches uh, that care not only for the player I am, but for the person that I am. And they care about my well-being. I have uh, a great physio, fitness coach, great agent. Uh, everybody that works around me is, is really, uh, you know, taking good care and making sure that I have everything I need and making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm well. So um, I think that's also helped a lot in the process. And I think uh, my parents gave me um, a good foundations in my education to, 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 to navigate in the, in the world I'm, uh, I'm in now. So that's why I think, you know, through the years, uh, even though things have gone fast at times, I've been able to to stay pretty grounded and and not you know uh, I guess break or um, crack under pressure like uh, like we <laughs> like well to say here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we should go back to the beginning, I guess. How you know, for a lot of the listeners, they won't necessarily have been to Quebec. What? How was it growing up in that kind of historic town? It was nice. Um, so it was for my dad's job actually, because my mom is uh, originally from uh, Montreal which is the biggest city in that uh, province. And then Quebec City was, was nice because I grew up in a neighborhood where I could walk to school. 
um, where I had I could walk to the tennis courts, I could bike around with my friends, uh, even you know without my parents always being behind me, I could just go to to my friend's house or go uh, do anything I wanted uh, around the neighborhood. So it was really a nice way to grow up. You know, I spent uh, six seven years there, and it's really good memories of just uh, being able to to have uh, you know really a kid's life that's just enjoying his time going to school uh, and I was playing a lot of tennis especially in the summer my dad had a summer camp going on um, at the local club and I was able to to play a lot of tennis there and, and have fun with my friends so uh, honestly uh, nothing crazy of a city or exotic even though it's got a, a rich history but my name my, my childhood was just um, uh, perfect in a way uh, I was able to to be very balanced and, and have uh, all the things I needed. I mean, it sounds from what you're saying that it sounds like you kind of, you grew up with a tennis racket in your hand. Can you kind of tell us how you started getting into tennis? What, what was the kind of route in? Well, my dad has always been a big passionate of, of the game of tennis. Um, he's a tennis coach himself, uh, now owns an academy. And uh, he's the one that first showed me tennis with my sister. So. I mean, I often say that I don't really have a clear memory of not playing tennis, and that's how far it goes back. <laughs> like, I don't remember the day I started because I just felt like uh, tennis was always in my life. Like, I always had a racket in my hand. I mean, we often Amazing. make jokes that uh, pretty much uh, I was walking and my dad put me put a racket in my Ooh. hand and I was hitting some tennis balls around the house. So it started at a really young age and the, and the passion just got stronger and stronger and I, I had good abilities and I think my dad also saw a good potential and, and some talent in, in me uh, at a young age. So um, I think uh, with that, he had, he had very high ambitions for me because he thought I, I would have possibilities to be uh, maybe a good player one day because that was my dream from the age of six or seven years old was to be a professional player one day. So, so my dad believed and he, he saw the potential. So he really pushed me to, to keep going. And you and you loved it from the get go, I guess. I mean, it was really it was something that you actually enjoyed as well. It wasn't as if you were kind of, you know, forced into that space. You, exactly. You, no, exactly. What was, what, for sure. What was that feeling? What, what was that feeling that you kind of had? What was the thing that connects you to that kind of racket? You, you know what I mean? What, mm -hmm. uh, at what point did it kind of become well, galvanized? Well, you know, t tennis is not easy because it's a very technical sport. Um, I mean, in some ways, of course, there's more movement, but you could compare it to, you know, golf or a golf swing where like a serve in tennis is, is very technical. There's a lot of things that go into it to perfect that movement. And as a kid, it, it, the, the learning process is, is, is tough. You know, it's long and you have to know how to hit every shot, the forehand, the backhand, the serve, the volley. So the process is long so that was a side that was difficult for me you know to 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 to, to learn the, the the technique and to perfect it and I always had the more natural shots uh as my my forehand or my serve but for me the the the, the thing i liked the most well like two things i would say was first just hitting a ball nicely is the best feeling uh like again with golf i think if you hit the center and the sound is nice it's the best feeling so i think in tennis when you hit a nice serve uh, with a good sound and in and, and, and the center of the racket, it's really a great feeling in your, in your arm and in your body. And the second thing for me was the competition that I loved. I wow. loved uh, the challenge to, to play tournaments, to compete, um, and the feeling of winning because uh, I was not only competitive in, in tennis, trust me, uh, if you ask my, my family uh, in board games or, or card games at home, I was always uh, very competitive. Really? So do you, think, do you kind of think you need that killer instinct, that real kind of drive to succeed in order to do what you do? Well, I think in a way, yes. Um, we all have a different way to, to approach competition. But in the end, in the world uh, I'm in, uh, there's a winner and a loser every day, every match. And that's just the reality of it. Of course, you win some, you lose some, but you need to want to win almost more than the opponent or as much at least. So um, the, really the, the, the competition is uh, something that's been in my life or that's been in my day to day for forever, pretty much, you know, and mm. always uh, in, in training, physical training, 
when it was with my my peers, my friends, when I was training at the national center with six or seven other boys, we had this healthy competition that I think pushed us to to improve every day, and that's the thing that I think was um, uh, important for, for me in the process of becoming the player I am today was to 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 learn uh, and how to to deal with that competitive side of of this world. How do you deal with that? I, 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 it's quite an interesting thing because you know when you're a young boy having to kind of go up against your friends and kind of dealing with that competition. How, what, what's the how do you do? It? How do you do it? You know, I think in life I'm um, I'm a pretty no like normal guy or nice guy. Like I'm not um, I don't like uh, have you know big sense of empathy. I think and you never like to see let's say a friend or even your peers, your colleagues, you to. You don't like to to beat them or you don't like to see them sad or you don't like to make them feel bad so that's a thing that uh, sucks a little bit sometimes is you know we have a lot of respect either for you know uh, colleagues friends and but in the end we have to compete and, and play each other and, and beat each other so um, you have to kind of learn how to when you're on the court you need to to compete to to, to both your your highest level and there's a phrase that's stuck with me uh, that my coach told me um, a couple years ago was that in the end, the best way to respect your opponent or to respect the player on the other side of the net is to play your best tennis and maybe to beat him. Because in the process of, of beating him, uh, you show him what he has to improve. You're basically uh, playing him with honesty and, and showing him what he can improve and how he, he will be a better player in the future. Because I've lost many matches that uh, I've learned from and that have made me a better player. So I think right. in a way, that's how I approach it more and more now is like, I need this adversity. I should not like shy away. I should not like, not like it because uh, I need it uh, to become uh, a better player. Sure. I mean, I also get the sense that obviously you have to make massive sacrifices to do what you do, to kind of be where you are, that, you know, there are things that you will have had to forego. Um, you know, have you missed out on school? Have you missed out on social life? Like, is there anything you feel like you've kind of actually really missed and you kind of regret that? Or or is that not something that plays in your kind of sphere of feeling? Um, not so much, I would say, because growing up, I still had a pretty balanced life. Uh, you can understand that I started playing uh, very seriously or taking tennis very seriously at a young age. We're talking six, seven, eight years old, already traveling to play tournaments, playing tournaments every weekend and all that. But still in the end, um, I had a great social life uh, with, you know, I had a lot of friends. I was going to normal school. Um, and so in the end, I would say when I think back, I have no regrets because I had I made the choice, of course, to play a lot of tennis because that's what I loved. But I also felt like I've experienced everything a young boy or a teenager had to experience. Uh, I really did. So Amazing. it was it was the perfect balance. And um, of course, there gets to a point where uh, I wouldn't call them sacrifices, but I think it's choices that you have to make, and you have to accept that. Yeah, certain choices come with with certain circumstances where um, if I choose to become a professional tennis player and that's my dream, then surely I'm going to have to pass out on some nights out with my friends or, or, or not going to training or a lazy Sunday. So for sure, I'm going to have to pass out on those, but I, I still had them uh, sometimes. So it was a good balance. Amazing. So earlier this year, it was announced that you'd be working with Tony Nadal, Raft's uncle, who would be your coach, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And he's a legend in tennis, and he's been praised for his mental focus, which is extraordinary. I mean, that idea of mental focus, is that the decisive edge between being a good player and a champion like Nadal? I mean, is it an area of your game that you're kind of trying to strengthen with Uncle Tony, in inverted uh, commas? Yeah. No, it's a great thing uh, that I have him uh, on my side now that we've decided uh, as a team to, to, to add him and to, uh, to get to uh, uh, his experience and his knowledge from the, from the high level. And just, yeah, kind of what he's been through with, uh, with his nephew and to see how we can learn from this and what he can teach me. But I think, of course, the big thing is that everybody, a lot of players hit the ball really well, have great shots. Mm. 
uh, are good physically. Now you see players, everybody runs well, everybody's fast, everybody's strong. But in the end, on your career, the difference will be the consistency that you will be able to have, you know, year after year. Uh, once you reach a certain level, it's about, of course, trying to improve to stay consistent because everybody's trying to be better. And uh, that's a big thing that, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on. And it goes through many things, you know, as much as technically, tactically in the game, mentally, like you said, the focus that you have to bring every practice, but uh, trying just to be more consistent with, uh, with my shots, with my precision. And it's a process, you know, it's a process and it's an everyday process. It's not uh, something that you, you're able to perfect, um, um, you know, one day after the day after the other, but Tony is a, is a good help and I like him a lot. He's a, he's a great person, great character. So we're, we're, I enjoy working with him. I mean, it must've been quite mad playing Nadal, I mean, you know, playing against Nadal, like, how was that for you? Like, that, the pressure of that must be enormous, you know, particularly when, when you have that connection to Tony in, in that kind of way. Well, I haven't played uh, Rafael Nadal since I'm working with Tony, uh, so that hasn't okay, happened so, yet. But okay. I did play uh, Rafael two years ago, uh, actually mm -hmm. here in Madrid, uh, which I lost in, in, in two sets. But it was, an, it was a good match for my, on my part. It was a good learning experience. You know, I kind of went into this match really having nothing to lose, trying to, to you know, find a way to to give myself a chance uh, and of course always believing that I can win but uh, in the end it was good to see um, you know to feel how he plays live on the court to feel his ball uh, to feel the pressure that he can put on you and and also showing me what areas I can improve um, to maybe one day beat players like this yeah I can imagine I mean with that in mind do you kind of have mental preparation um, rituals that you go through when you're kind of preparing for that kind of match? I mean, first thing is I focus on myself rather than the opponent. Um, right. I think more and more it's about if you're able to bring your best game uh, every day, you're going to give yourself good chances against, you know, all the players to win. And then, of course, you have to adapt on the opponent sometimes a little bit tactically or during the match you see what's working you see what's not working and there's also a whole that we don't see uh from the outside but there's a lot of thinking going on um between points or between games at the changeover to kind of see what's working and to adapt your 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 shots and your choices and no but before the match i stick to my routine i i do the the, the same thing every time you know uh warm up uh, you know a couple hours before the match depending on the hour get some food in um, then relax and then I start warming up um, when uh, my match uh, gets close to starting and I just focus on that routine do the things I have to do and that's that's uh, how I approach it so having that kind of consistency is really important you need to kind of stick to the same thing every time in order to kind of make your mind focused on the task in hand is that is that key that can like idea of consistency i think the consistency uh and the routine brings confidence i think nothing else does really if you feel like you can repeat a same amount of work or if you can repeat a shot many times and be precise or you can repeat your your routine uh physically that's when it, that's what's going to give you the confidence that you're getting stronger that you feel better for me, it's not about changing every day and and not doing the same thing. I feel like it's you have to build something uh, solid, and that comes from consistency in, in doing uh, simple things. Right, it's interesting. I mean, so tennis, speaking frankly, it's often perceived as a kind of sport of choice of middle classes, um, you know, and it's a very white sport traditionally. Yeah. Do you see yourself as kind of having a maybe not a duty, but a role in kind of um, pushing diversity within tennis and kind of making that conversation happen in a way that maybe it hasn't happened before? The barrier has been broken already by players before me. If mm -hmm. I think of Archer Ash, if I think of Yannick Noah, players from immigrant parents or from African descendants who uh, were able to succeed at a high level in tennis and, and win Grand Slams and win biggest tournaments in our sport. 
So they've already shown um, that. And I think at, at times also when uh, racism was even more active in the people's life, uh, I think at the time of Archer Ash, for example, I think it took him a lot of courage. And uh, I think he spoke really highly. And he's one of those people that you could say left uh, a mark in history. Like he left a legacy behind him, uh, which is really important. And I think I'm kind of in the following of that, which um, I was, when I was growing up, um, I was already seeing a little bit of diversity on the tennis scene and in sports in general and felt like I have my place there too. I never felt like I was out of place or that it wasn't for me. And I'm glad to see more and more diversity in tennis. And I hope that with me in it, with other players from everywhere around the world, that we'll really able to see, really be able to see a melting pot in tennis and even, you know, tennis players coming from from Africa and everything. So that would be a great thing. And I'm, I'm glad that I can play my, my, my part in that a little bit. So have you felt kind of accepted by the community all the way through your career? Is that, has there ever been a moment where you've kind of felt, I don't know, like to struggle to be um, accepted as part of it? No, I honestly felt always very accepted. Um, I always treated everybody around me, I think, with, uh, with respect, treated them well, and they treated me well in return, uh, and they've respected me in return. So I think that's how I, I was approaching uh, uh, my relationships or the relationship with players, with tournaments, with fans. So I think I always got that respect back and I really never felt like I was out of place from the moments I was just a kid t until now. So you just talked about Yannick Noah and kind of these other tennis players that kind of went before you and kind of spearheaded that charge. I, I, I understand you had a nice exchange with Yannick Noah when you were a junior player at Roland Garros. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It was a kind of a surprise because I was playing the French Open junior final, which is an important moment for me. And uh, in the end, the match unfolds in a way that I have match points. I don't convert them. I end up losing. So I'm devastated <laughs> at the time, really, because I was so close from winning, you know, a prestigious trophy as a junior. And uh, I didn't. And Yannick actually came right on the court uh, to hug me or to give me, I guess, a, a tap in, in the back and tell me that he believes in me and that uh, that I make him think of him when he was younger as well and uh, that he really thinks highly of me and that he wishes me the best for the future. And at the time, I remember just not uh, wanting to talk, really. You know, Yannick no was there, yeah. but... All I had in my mind is that, oh my God, I just lost this final with, with match points. It's terrible, you know, and I didn't, I, I wanted no part of discussing or even being on the court. I just wanted to get out. So, but then later when I came back to the locker room, uh, which was on the other side of the, of the site uh, at Roland Garros, um, uh, Yannick actually um, made his way all the way over there to come in the locker and, and, and see me. Uh, and, and, and talk to me again, uh, where mm. now I was kind of more uh, settled. The emotions were a little bit, you know, uh, I was calmer, I would say. And, um, <laughs> you know, he had really good words for me again, where that he believes in, in, in my game and my talent a lot and that he, he feels or he thinks that I could do um, amazing things in, in tennis. How important is it to have the kind of um, the well, adulation is the wrong word, but that kind of you know support from these kind of legends that exist in the world that you inhabit? Like, does it really kind of change things for you? Do you need that to kind of push your game forward? I wouldn't say I would. I need it um, mm. because I've gone without it before, and at times where um, I was just you know focusing on my craft and focusing on my path, my career. So I wouldn't say I need it, but it's always a nice thing to hear. I mm. think what it just shows you is that you're working in the right direction and that you're doing the right things. Because if people mm. that have accomplished um, the biggest things in the sport are thinking highly of you and think that you have potential to, to maybe want do something um, uh, amazing in the sport, it shows that 
or it says that you're doing <laughs> right things at the moment. But then the ball is in your hands to to be able to to fulfill that uh, as a player. So in the end, it's great to hear, but I always come back to focusing on myself and what I have to do because in the end, uh, I have to to win those matches by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So Denis Shapovalov is a Canadian and he's a great friend of yours, obviously, and he's one year older than you and he's 10 ranks ahead in the ATP ranking. I mean, how hard is it to be friends with a competitor? How does that work? Yeah, it's it's not always simple because, for example, we wanted to catch up and have dinner in, in Barcelona, but then you see the draw and you see, oh, <laughs> we'll play each other in the second round. So <laughs> you kind of you don't want to have dinner with uh, with your opponent the night before, uh, of course. Yeah, of course. But, uh, at the same time, I think uh, we're both, uh, we have very high respect for each other and uh, we think really highly of each other. So we're able to have a great relationship outside of the court. And then once we play each other, uh, it's the best men that wins and we compete as, hi- as, as high as we can. And we're really motivated to, to win, but it's strictly, you know, it strictly stays on the court. And then we're, we're all good uh, outside of the court. And we've had amazing moments that we shared together, such as in, in juniors winning in doubles together. And then we played Davis Cup together. Um, so we had, you know, a lot of, of moments uh, playing in team events and we shared successes. So that also connects you with, with somebody. When you're, you know, playing someone, when you're, uh, that you have this opponent, do you kind of have to dehumanize them in order to be able to kind of focus on the task in hand because I guess if you, you're thinking about them emotionally then it's going to kind of cloud your ability is that is that right yeah you're totally right I think um, you know in the end you have to focus on the ball right uh, I mean yeah, it's not that easy sure. to to do uh, it's easier said than done because for example if for instance you're playing Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal like the, the ball's coming at you but there's also a whole uh, <laughs> I would say uh, like just the pressure of who they are and what they've done. You know, there's like yeah. 20 grand slams coming at you, right? When you step <laughs> yeah. on the court. So it's not easy to, to separate, you know, the, of course, the level that they play and the person that, or what your opponent is. But mm. in the end, I think I got, I'm in a place now today after a few years on the tour where having practiced and played with all the best players in the rankings and and all the best players of the past and, and the present I, i'm able to really you know uh approach any match um with confidence that i can win and not see you know uh, like you said humanize the the opponent and just see them as you know okay another opponent and a match to play and and kind of forget uh everything uh, of the outside you know mm. i mean with that in mind, it kind of strikes me that tennis is quite a lonely sport. I mean, you know, if you're playing rugby or football or whatever, you have a team around you and you're kind of working together to kind of achieve that goal, so to speak. But in tennis, it's it's all on you. I mean, yeah. how do you how do you kind of cope with that? How do you manage that feeling? No, it is uh, very lonely. I mean, on one hand, I think I've been used to it uh, over the years, but. Um, it, it is at times, um, you know, you have to dig in uh, really deep mm-hmm. within yourself to find solutions. Because once you're on the court, I often compare it as, okay, let's say chess or um, gladiators back in the days that once you, <laughs> you, once you step into the arena, um, there's no outside sources that can really help you. Of course, there's the oh. crowd, there's your coaches encouraging you or being there for you. But in the end, you have to f- sit down and think and dig in and, 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 and find solutions on your own. And sometimes it's tough mentally. Sometimes a match gets tough physically and you have to find solutions on your own and be responsible. But I think, um, you know, the fact that it's lonely, yes, on the, on the one hand, it's, it's not easy. But I think it's, um, it's uh, taught me a lot uh, already in my life that, you know, you're responsible uh and you have to um have you know high esteem for yourself because in the end in pressure moments sometimes you can only rely on you so uh, i think it's taught me a very uh high level of um 
responsibility and being responsible for the good things and bad things that happen for you sometimes. That's extraordinary. I mean, because as we were talking about earlier, I mean, you are very young to have kind of come to that conclusion to figure out that's what you need to do. I mean, have there been moments where you've struggled to like find that responsibility in yourself and that kind of sense of inner strength? Well, yeah, and I actually have a story about that. So uh, that the day that I think it really clicked in my mind that at, we love a story. Yeah, like <laughs> at, that, at times I, I, had, I would have to just rely on myself. So I was playing uh, in 2016, I was playing the junior US Open that I won actually in the end. And I was kind of a favorite going into the tournament and I was in the second round um, and I was super nervous. Uh, and I was playing at a very, very poor level uh, at the start of the match. Uh, and I just felt like so tensed. And in the match, my coach was sitting on the side and every time something bad was happening or every time uh, I didn't have a good feeling on the court or I, I wasn't finding solutions, I would look at him. I would just look at him, look at him, keep looking at him and, and be like, you know, what's going on, right? right? But what my coach did at the time was he basically, every time I looked at him, he looked away. <laughs> He looked, he looked away and he looked on the side or he, he looked down, but he just didn't give me attention. And it was really like a case of, you know, almost a kid looking for attention and not mm. getting what he wanted. Mm. So he didn't say a word. He didn't look at me. And it, I was frustrated at the time. Right. But in the end, I won the oh, match. Sure. I won the match. And then we talked and he said, you know, I did this on purpose to show you that you have the resources within yourself and, 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 you know, deep in your, in your core, like you have those resources, you found, a, you found a way to, to win the match in the end without my help. And mm. if you want to win this tournament, you're going to have to, you know, at times find the solutions on your own. And of course, I mean, I needed to play better after that in the, in the, in the upcoming matches, but that was really a moment where it stuck in, you know, it, it struck me that, um, in the end, once I'm on the court, I can't be looking for outside help and outside uh, resources. I, I'm there, I'm responsible, and I'm strong enough that uh, and I've worked hard enough and with my coaches before that I have the solutions within myself. Were you kind of angry with him for doing that? <laughs> like, that they're kind of playing that little game with you. It's kind was. of a risky game to play. I was. I it was were. risky. It was risky. Yeah. It was risky from him. Because it's not like it's something we said that we would do before. <laughs> and I mean, it was an important yeah. match. And all of a sudden, that's what he felt like he needed to do. Because I guess also at the time, it was a little bit too much. Um, I was uh, maybe looking at him or looking for answers outside a little bit too much. But mm. it was gutsy. And But I think it was uh, the good lesson for me. And I guess the point is that you succeeded and you did it, which is the which is the key. Yeah. Um, so we should talk a little bit about your kind of your health. You suffer from cardiac arrhythmia, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Um, how how is that to kind of how does that affect your playing? I mean, if if it does at all. So I've actually suffered because I okay. got an intervention. Past tense. Yeah, past tense. Okay. I'm I'm glad to say <laughs> now that today. Because uh, it was a struggle uh, for a lot of years. I mean, I first had it when I was seven or eight years old. Um, and then it would come from time to time doing different activities, sometimes doing nothing, sometimes just swimming. Of course, playing tennis or training at a high intensity, I would sometimes get it. And we couldn't really find, find the reason why. And I actually tried an intervention when I was 12 or 13 years old. And... Uh, the doctors couldn't find the issue, couldn't find where it was coming from. And then uh, the big incident was that at 2018 US Open, I was playing my first Grand Slam match against Dennis. And I actually had to withdraw in the third set because uh, I started having yeah cardiac uh, arrhyth arrhythmia on the court. And there was no chance for me to, to keep playing. So that was a tough moment for my family and I. Uh, and then... We decided, okay, uh, let's see what we can do. And uh, we reached out to a um, heart uh, surgeon doctor uh, that we already knew in Montreal. And uh, at the end of that year, in 2018, I, I went to do a surgery again, and uh, it worked uh, successfully. So um, oh, amazing. it was amazing uh, because then he, he said, okay, then we'll, we hope 
and you have to go out there and try and see if uh, nothing happens again. And now it's going to be almost three years and uh, I haven't had anything since. So um, it's quite oh, amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So that's it's just something that you don't have to worry about at all anymore. Yeah, no, no, it hasn't happened since, so it's great. Oh, that's good. I mean, what's your kind of next goal as a tennis player? I mean, you know, there's a lot still to do. Yeah, you're, you're still very early yeah. in your career. But what's the kind of big thing for you? What's the, what's the achievement you kind of want next on your belt? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, I want to win a title. Um, mm. You know, I've reached a lot of seven finals, uh, which is great. You know, for my young career and uh, the consistency that I've been able to have with my results is great. But I want to be able to, you know, to reach that peak and just give myself a chance to to get those opportunities again and to win a big title. Um, mm. But I think the main focus is not just winning. You know, any title. I think uh, the big thing is to, of course, it's going to go from improvement and me becoming a better player. But in terms of of results on paper, um, the yeah, the big goal for me is to win, uh, you know, a Masters in the years to come, a Grand Slam, uh, you know, being in the top eight, um, playing the, you know, the top eight Masters at the end of the year. These are, you know, uh, achievements or results that, I'm really look looking forward to do or that I that I'm really motivated to do. So, but it starts with uh with consistency of work and and results and then things will will kind of unfold uh how I want to if I'm able to do that. Is there a specific tournament that you're most excited by? Like what what's the what's the kind of big one for you? Well, I've always loved uh Wimbledon since the day I've been. Uh it has such a history such prestige to it and um, it's so unique because of the fact that in the end we don't have a lot of tournaments on the grass anymore and to be able to to play on grass courts uh, that are so perfect and so beautiful yeah. um, it's really uh, an amazing tournament uh, to play and it would be an amazing tournament to win one day and then for me for sure, a tournament that's close to my heart is the Masters uh, 1000 in um, in Montreal. Um, of course. I we do play also in Toronto, uh, which is amazing because I get to play at home. But the one in Montreal is really even closer to my heart because that's where I was born, that's where my family lives now, and that's where I've spent uh, a lot of my time. You know, growing up or when I was a teenager, I was training at that stadium uh, every day. So winning there in front of uh, the fans of uh, my fans of the fans uh, from my hometown, um, you know, on home soil would be a dream come true. I'm sure it will happen. I mean, is there a moment when you're kind of in a match and you get that kind of feeling where you are owning that, you're, you're owning it, you know that you are in control and everything you're doing is working and every shot that you hit is perfect. And like, if that happens, how... Do you kind of, how do you know that it's happened? How do you get yourself to that point? Well, I had a moment like this in practice earlier, so <laughs> it was good uh, playing practice matches and practicing and everything was going exactly how I wanted, you know? So um, really? Amazing. that's always, it. of course, it's the best feeling because uh, winning in the end is great, but sometimes you win and you didn't feel good on the court, like you felt nervous or like that match at the US Open 2016 that I mentioned earlier. Um, those are matches that you end up winning, but you're not so happy with where your level is. But the first, the feeling of hitting, striking the ball uh, nicely in a clean way, uh, aiming for a target and being able to, to hit it time after time after time and serving well, that's an amazing feeling. And uh, honestly, that's, what you look for as a player is to enjoy your game also. I mean, uh, it's a game after all. And when you're able to, to enjoy yourself and, and, and play well, uh, it's, the, it's the best feeling or it's the most gratifying feeling, I would say. It's, re it's really interesting that you're talking about the kind of hitting the ball nicely. I don't think I've ever heard a tennis player talk about that in the same kind of way. But obviously it's that kind of the ability to kind of follow through and get that beautiful shot. Is that the kind of, that's the epitome of everything that you're striving for? That kind of perfect 
yeah. it is when you're able to it's fascinating um i mean the best players in our game uh yes they're competitors winners and they're strong physically mentally but their first thing is they're amazing technically and they're so consistent mm -hmm. with the ball striking that they that they hit and uh it's kind of just this dopamine um uh, feeling every time you hit it like for for a split second uh it's the it's the best feeling for me as a, as a player it's like uh right. but when you don't hit a shot nicely then again it's like you get frustrated or you don't like it uh yeah. but when you hit that shot well and you strike it nicely and it hits the target exactly where uh you wanted it's uh it's the best feeling there is for us so that the idea of frustration, you do often see that. I mean, there are obvious, obvious examples of people that kind of epitomize that idea of frustration on the court. Um, but how do you overcome that feeling? Because I imagine once that happens, it must be very easy for that to be a slippery slope and for you to kind of go down from that point. How do you kind of buoy yourself back up? Well, I haven't perfected uh, yet. Uh, it's the, it's it's a it's. A constant work um it's a constant work uh of being able to control more and more your emotions your ideas being able to play every point almost in the same way uh where you know you're able to to refocus uh before every point and uh it's it's a constant work really so I would say in the past I've done well and I felt like I've improved and I've always had a, a pretty, uh, I would say, cold head or I was pretty calm uh, naturally. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not always easy when you start losing, let's say, confidence on a shot during a match or you start getting frustrated because you had chances and you missed them to be able to really stick in the present and not get frustrated from the past and anxious of the future you know, and to be really in that uh, specific zone of, of, of the present moment is a, is a constant balance, you know, and I don't think anybody has perfected it yet, but mm -hmm. you always have to aim for that. You have to aim for it, I mean, at least. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting because that is mindfulness, right? It's like, you know, we suddenly talk about this much more in kind of wider society, but that's what everyone is kind of striving for to live in the moment you know and i think it, yeah. it, this it feels like a real kind of drill down into that notion which i mean it's kind of that's really what it is and it's valid for many things in life but uh for us as players it's uh, even more because we're faced with the truth every time we're faced with the fact that um you know somebody's gonna win somebody's gonna lose and yeah. it's straight competition sometimes i think in the day-to-day -day life these things are more hidden um, because you can get away with it or you can decide, well, okay, today I'm not, okay, I don't feel good. I'm not going to do much. I'm going to, you know, uh, stay at home and I'm going to do what I need to do tomorrow. But when the day of the match comes, uh, you have to deal with, uh, however you feel, you have to deal with your frustrations. You have to feel with your temper, your mood, whatever it is, and you have to do the best with it. So I think this competition in this world or Tennis for me teaches me how to stay more and more in the present. And um, like I, I, I think I might have mentioned it earlier, but a phrase that I read that, you know, stuck with me is that in the end, where do we get frustration from is from the past. You know, we only get frustration. If you stay in the past, you're going to be frustrated. And if you live in the future, yeah. you will be anxious. Right. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of um, finding that middle ground is, uh, is something I, I work on and something that um, I always aim for. It's a skill, for sure. I mean, moving on from tennis slightly. Um, so while I was preparing for this, I watched an interview with you and I think it was for, um, I, I, I can't actually remember what show it was, but you were wearing a very nice houndstooth jacket uh, and a black turtleneck jumper. It was like a Canadian TV show. Yeah. Is, fa is fashion kind of a, a thing for you? Like, I mean, tennis is traditionally a very stylish sport, right? Yeah. Particularly in, um, you know, in Wimbledon. Yeah. Do you, do you kind of care about that kind of thing? I do. I do. Um, That's what I like to I, hear. I, I like it. No, no, I really, <laughs> I really like it. I mean, I like to, I'm kind of the opposite of the stereotype of uh, a guy that doesn't like to shop or that doesn't like fashion. I, 
I really enjoy it. I like to shop for myself. I like to have uh, nice clothes, uh, nice things for me. And I like to dress up nicely for occasions. Um, I would say that in the day to day, I'm mostly conservative. Probably I would go with yeah, black trousers, uh, white shoes and um, a, like, a, I don't know, white top or a clear top. But yeah. I, I like to 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 dress well or to to wear unique uh, uh, pieces or special things on, on, on certain occasions. I mean, I guess lockdown then must have been a little bit depressing for you because there was no opportunity it to was, dress up, right? It was. I mean, I've, yeah. <laughs> I've, sh- I've shopped way less, which in a way was, uh, was a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I've, yeah, I haven't been able to really dress up for any occasion uh, in the last two years. Right. Uh, almost, no, one year and a half, sorry. So um, it's, uh, yeah, I think lockdown uh, hasn't been good for, for my fashion uh, life. <laughs> I don't think it has been for anyone. Yeah. Just slippers slippers and tracksuit bottoms. Exactly. Um, so it's often said that Nadal, um, no matter what the match situation, never gives a point. But on your end, you decided to give points to this amazing initiative in Togo. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you kind of, where that came from and how it came about? Well, I'm, I'm glad that it's in place. Uh, I've always uh, dreamt of having something in place uh, if, you know, of course, if it was possible and if I reached a point in my life career that I was able to to do it. And especially, you know, in this way, being able to connect my tennis career and my desire to, to give opportunities uh, to the ones that don't have it. Uh, so being able to connect that by giving five dollars every point I win is a is a great setup and it's a great thing um, that I that I love doing, and yeah, it, of course it gives I think uh, a higher purpose and a higher meaning to to my career to every win I make to every points. I know that it's uh, not only helping me, but it's helping uh, a lot of kids out there um, in Togo. So. Uh, I'm glad of um, the way it's been, uh, it's happened. Uh, I didn't know exactly at the time or I, I knew always that I had this intention to to do something of that type one day. And I have other projects in the future of own, having my own foundation, doing projects in, of course, different fields, different countries, uh, doing events uh, to promote things that are close to my heart. So there's a lot of things that I will be able to do in the future. But in the meantime, um, I'm glad that, you know, this is in place and I haven't been able to um, to visit the progress uh, with my own eyes or to 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 see to to be on the grounds since uh, uh, I started the initiative when COVID started. So it hasn't been uh, I haven't had an opportunity to go, but I'm looking forward to having a chance to actually see the, the progress in person. Do you think as a kind of public figure, someone in the public eye, you have a responsibility these days to kind of give back um, kind of in any way that you can? Is that the, is it the same for everyone? Is that something you just kind of have to do now? Do you have a responsibility? No, I don't think you do. But when I see people do it, I, I think it's great. You know, I think it's a great mm-hmm. thing. Uh, we're blessed and privileged to be in the position we're in now, uh, of course, there's hard work that comes with it, or, and for some people, huge sacrifices. And everyone has their story, you know, to mm. let's say to to be in a very high position in, in society. But I think mm. once you've uh, arrived there, uh, I think sharing uh, your success, I think, brings even more pleasure, and in the end, and even more fulfillment. Than keeping it all for yourself so that's kind of the idea that i have is like uh you know to share my success and then if by doing that i inspire or i'm able to give a chance to others and they then they are able to also succeed themselves then uh, it's a nice uh, cycle that uh, you've created that's how i like to to believe uh, that uh, that's what i like to believe and that's how i approach it do you manage to go back to Togo much? How often do you go? I don't. I've been there once. Not at all. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, no, I've been there once because uh, my dad left the country in the late 90s. Uh, he met my mom there 
and then they came back together to Canada. And he didn't go for almost 10 years. Uh, he didn't go back for almost 10 years because, um, I mean, at first he was coming to, to of course, to work. Uh, he was focused on raising his family, uh, saving money. And it was costly, you know, to, to travel there and to help everybody, the whole family over there. Uh, so my dad at first didn't get much opportunities. And then in the last years, he's been a couple times, he's been more and more. But uh, I had one chance to go. But then since then, you also have your schedule and you have your things to do. And uh, you're not always able to, to, to find the time to, to travel uh, to travel there. So, uh, But I hope to, to get a chance to go again soon. Well, you've got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, you do. Are, I, like, I like to you think are, I have. You are I only do. 20. Yeah. <laughs> you do. You're only 20. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, when I was growing up watching Wimbledon, it was like Pete Sampras. You grew up, I guess, with Federer, Nadal, Djokovic. Yeah. Like, who, who, were your, who were your like real idols when you were coming into the sport? Who were the people that you looked at and like, oh my God, I just want to be, well, not be them, but you know, you were inspired by? I think... Uh... It is not very original, but <laughs> Federer and Nadal are the the, the 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 people that I looked up to, or the players that I looked up to growing up. I mean, they were everywhere uh, in all the finals, winning all the big trophies, and um, they were amazing. I mean, also the rivalry that they had created amazing matches. When we think back on the 2008 final in Wimbledon, for example, uh, these are amazing moments for the sport to inspire kids like like myself. So um, uh, I always looked up to them, but I wouldn't say I was never a, a personality to idolize in a way where um, I had like I would have like posters in my room or that I would like be dying for autographs or signatures at tournaments. I, I was just more enjoying their game whenever I had a chance to see it and enjoying their matches. And then I also had. Somebody I looked up to was um, French player Joe Wilfried Tsonga, which I think uh, when we talked earlier about, you know, diversity and having people that you can look up to and, and having that representation in your field, I think players like him really helped in a way kids like me to, to have people on their screens that, you know, you can look alike and that you can really, yeah, identify yourself to. And I also love this game, love this style. You know, uh, he was always a very charismatic player with uh, with a powerful game, and and was putting on a show every time he played. So um, I always loved uh, watching uh, Joe. Well, we have one more question, so that works very Perfect. well. Um, I, I'm kind of intrigued because you know we we have slightly touched on this, but for you, when is the moment? a specific moment where you've had to kind of overcome your inner saboteur, that inner voice that is saying, this is not working, I'm, I'm not worth this, I'm failing. Like, what Has there been a moment where you've had to really overcome that? And can you specify it? Or, I don't know, is there, is there, yeah. it might be tricky to find. Uh, there hasn't been, luckily for me, there hasn't been uh, many moments <laughs> like this. I think uh, I've had, let's say, tough weeks or tough couple of months where I wasn't winning as much. Uh, but in the end, things came back uh, like I wanted, I think with, uh, I think with work and with belief and with resilience, uh, and I'm going to focus on that word and emphasis that word because uh, that's, I think, something that was always very important for me during all my young career so far. And I think it's important for every player, but especially for me. And I think I was had a, a great capacity of being able to bounce back, you know, after a loss, after a tough moment, after a tough couple of weeks, months. And I think in the past, uh, I always believed a lot in my resilience to overcome, uh, you know, adversity and tough moments uh, because there was times uh, when I moved on from juniors to professionals or uh, when I got injured, for example, and I twisted my knee and then I was a couple of weeks out and then I had to come back and I wasn't winning so much. These were tough moments, but I think I had a very high uh, resilience and I think uh, it's a quality that uh, and a trait of character that's uh, really helped me a lot in, uh, in tougher moments. I bet. 
I mean, on that note, we will have to bring this to a close, but it's been fantastic Thank speaking you. to you. Thank you. It's Alex. been great. Thank you so much for joining us you. at The Edge. Yeah. Um, you, you are amazing and good luck with everything. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was nice career. talking to you as well. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for joining us at The Edge, a podcast by Tag Heuer. Don't forget to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Edge is also an online magazine. Go to magazine.tagheuer.com for more articles, interviews, and photo series that bring together our love of watches and our desire to push ourselves to the edge of our limits. I'm your host, Theo van den Broeke. Until next time, keep an eye out. This is The Edge.